Chapter 24, Part 2, The World at War. We're talking about the World War II. This is a war on two fronts. Never been done in American history. Not, not a small undertaking in either theater. Was huge on both fronts, and this is something that you know you got to manage. It's 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 a logistical nightmare. The the strategy in Europe had nothing to do with the strategy in Japan. So you you have two two military efforts that are completely separate from each other. But it was decided early on uh, the Allied strategy once America joined the war was to defeat Hitler first. So they focus on the war in Europe first. Now don't misunderstand me. I don't, I'm not suggesting that they didn't. In the, in the in the Pacific, they did, but but most of the efforts went into defeating Hitler first. This would be centered on an invasion that would primarily come through occupied France to Berlin and then to Hitler. But it really is a three pronged attack. You, you're coming across you're, you're coming across the English Channel from Britain to to, to France. You're coming um, north from uh, from North Africa through Italy, uh, liberating Italy. And you're also coming from the east of west. Russia comes from the from the east towards Berlin also. So you got three armies centered on, on surrounding Berlin. Uh, this invasion became known as D-Day, especially the part of where the uh, Allied forces landed at France. Uh, June 6, 1944, a very famous day in American history. A huge army is transported across the English Channel. And as you see, American, British, Canadian, uh, and they stormed the beach at Normandy. So you see the line here. The, the Germans knew they were coming. They weren't sure exactly where they were coming, but they were fortified over many, many miles. And here is the fortified German line that you've got to break through. So you, not only you have to storm the beach and get settled, you got to break this line and, and knock out their defenses. And they are hugely fortified with what they call pillboxes, these huge concrete uh, rooms, you know, very, very thick that would that would uh, not, you know, would shell would bounce off them. So very, very, uh, very challenging, you know, idea. Uh, you're you're attacking a fortified position. It's a deadly attack. Looking at our map, the three prongs I'm talking about. You're from London, of course, it's on the coast. This would be the shortest uh, distance here, but that's the most logical, and the Germans were ready there. So the Allies hit hit the beaches here down by Normandy. Uh, so they come across the channel. Me meanwhile, you've got troops coming from first, first North Africa and around the Mediterranean, but coming up through Italy and so on, all the way to Germany. You got the Russians coming from the east to the west, and you're all centered on getting getting around Berlin to take out Hitler. So, so D-Day is, a, is a, a heroic moment in American history and a moment of American glory. And, and Hollywood, especially in those days, um, perhaps not so much in the last uh, 20 or 30, but, but when I was young, young uh, movies were endless about D-Day and how, how the, the brave Americans came and, and won the day. And it's a great story. And Hollywood has certainly glorified it. Uh, and, and, you know, this endless heroics of the brave men who fought there. And make no mistake, it was it was all those things. But these men faced almost certain death. But but Hollywood portrays it as an inevitability that the invincible Americans cannot be stopped and they'll be victorious. So it really does borrow from the idea of manifest destiny. These are God's favorite people preordained. And they're going to you know, triumph in the end. They're they're the Americans. They they can't lose. This, this is this is what you were what you were shown in those days. I I really feel that this does these men that were actually there an injustice for for, for portraying it that way. Your know, bravery is not innate. It's not something you're born with. It's not something you inherit because of your nationality. Uh, bravery is born from fear in facing your own death. Where all of a sudden you start to ask yourself, as the bullets are flying, what am I doing here? And, you know, am I really going to risk my life for this cause? And fear takes over and you have to fight it. You know, combat is not something that people are prepared for. Every thought in your head is yelling at you to run. Uh, so a soldier must fight that fear and have the courage to continue. That's true bravery, not, not some steely-eyed uh, you know, hulking man that can do anything. That's not reality. That That's Hollywood. Reality are these were just 
uh, simple, typical men from different different cities in America came to fight for their cause, and they'd never seen anything like this before. They had to learn and gain that bravery by fighting through it. Uh, a recent film about D-Day, well, recent, not that recent, I guess, 22 years ago now. It's hard to believe it's been that many years, but uh, uh, more of the modern time era, anyway, is about D-Day is Saving Private Ryan. Uh, so this film's been praised by critics as a more realistic portrayal of what combat is like. It's not always heroic. It's, it's chaotic. It's confusing. It's surreal. And it evokes fear. And, 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 and some, some men lose themselves. They're, they're, they're gripped with fear. Uh, like I said, you've got to overcome it to, to keep going. So I want you to watch a, a film clip here. Uh, this is the opening scene of the movie. It's called the Omaha Beach Scene. So I just want to be clear that this is a pretty violent, grisly, gruesome film where you're seeing lots of, you know, body parts and, and deaths and and bullet wounds. And so if you're not, you know, if that's not something that you are OK with seeing, then it's perfectly fine not to watch it. But I'm, I'm showing you this to give you a representation of what combat is really like, that it's not always you know, these, these brave and heroic gallant men that, you know, cinch up their, their, their let's go, you know, let, let, someone, someone's got to do it. Let's go. It's, it's farm boys. It's, it's, you know, just, just the guy next door and they've never had to do this before in their lives. So, so again, the critics, historians praise this movie for being more realistic and, and you'll see the, the shock and, and fear that come over these men, even the commanders, even even the officers in charge. If you know who Tom Hanks is, it was the was the star of that movie. You see that he gets lost and and kind of forgets where he is for for a little bit, and then his his troops are screaming for orders, and he doesn't hear them because he's 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 in shock. Okay, uh, you'll see you'll see uh, on the on the ship over where they're about to drop the doors and go out. You, you see the boys crying. You see them praying. They're vomiting. They're calling for their mother. That that's the reality of fear, and and you know the the courage that it takes to get past that is is what I'm talking about here. So go ahead and watch the film Saving Private Ryan, Omaha Beach scene, and then come on back. <clears throat> so so we see that bravery is not always steely-eyed determination. Usually, it's born from fear, and then the personal anguish a person would experience was mind-numbing. And the actual courage it took to continue, knowing that your life could end at any second, that's true heroics and true bravery. Okay, so, so D-Day was a huge undertaking, an, incred an incredible large-scale effort between many countries. The logistics alone are astounding that, that you know, the United States and, and Great Britain and Canada could, could come together and coordinate this. Uh, but long story short, it, it was successful. They, they were able to break the German line and continue on into and liberated France. We'll talk about that here in a little bit. Um, you know, France was, was fell to the Germans early on in this war. And this was a big, big uh, loss to lose France. That, that was a huge ally of Britain and the United States. So, of course, the French people resist. And it's, a, you know, the, the, the story of, of the French in World War II is is a you could almost do a class on just that it's a pretty amazing uh pretty pretty ama amazing story uh so the so the so the liberation of france is, is a big part of this war it's it's a big moment for the allied troops and you know a big success and of course you know the allied people the people in the united states are and of course france and england they're they're ecstatic we we we're, we're pushing these these germans back uh, please watch the film entitled uh, The Allied Liberation of Paris, 1944, Allies and French Resistance, Free Paris from Nazis. And you'll see some archival footage from, from that was actually there of the troops coming in. And it's a pretty interesting video. Go ahead and watch that. OK, so Hitler and the German army are, by this time are hiding. And they've, they've, they've built bunkers underground to to escape all the bombing. This is what Berlin looked like. So this is this happened to London because the Nazis and they 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 got their payback. They they destroyed Berlin also. Uh, so Hitler is hiding beneath the rubble of what used to be Berlin. Uh, by this time they had been reduced from their once formidable selves. Victory was assured for the Allied forces. 
Uh, but then, but then America on April 12th, 1945, received an absolutely traumatic shock. Franklin Roosevelt dies in office, dies from a stroke, dead. People are completely shocked. This is the leader of the United States. Uh, and then just a couple of weeks, a, a couple of weeks later, um, Mussolini also dead. So what happened to him? Uh, he he had been deposed by this time. There, you remember I said that the Allied troops came through and liberated Italy. He was deposed. He he and his girlfriend were, were trying to escape, and they were actually caught and shot. Uh, their bodies were taken to Milan and left in a suburban square. This is April 28, 1945. Uh, a large crowd gathered around the bodies and hung them both upside down from a metal girder by meat hooks, and their bodies were beaten, shot, and hit with hammers. The people don't care too much about for him. He was a, he was a ruthless, uh, you know, leader uh, while he was in power. Uh, and amazingly, just two days later, Hitler commits suicide. Uh, he and his uh, new wife, Eva Braun, had been his girlfriend throughout the entirety of the war. They were always together. Uh, Hitler married her on uh, April 29th. The following day, he gave her cyanide to commit suicide with. And there's some dispute about what Hitler did, whether he took cyanide or shot himself. But whichever method it was, he commits suicide also. So in, in, a, in a matter of just a few weeks... After a long war, in, in three weeks' time, less than three weeks' time, the overall leader of, 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 the, of the overall commander of the United States, gone, Italy, gone, Germany, gone. The three very top leaders of this war, and suddenly they're gone. So as the Allied troops move across Germany, they start to find concentration camps. And this was always the, the rumor, death camps. Uh, th this was not completely known if this was actually happening. There was some rumor about it. You know, some minutes have they'd seen some things, but now they really find these things. As they come across Germany and the German armies skedaddling, they, they're not here anymore. The the Allied troops start to liberate the, you know, kind of pathetic to, to, to I don't mean to be insulting, but look at these poor people. They have, you know, they're malnourished, near death. Look at the little girl laying on the on the man's lap, and she's just a, literally just a little bag of bones. Uh, they find these people, and they and they learn the true story of of what the Germans were doing, and and you know Hitler, what he called his final solution. Uh, the final solution was designed to exterminate the Jewish race from the earth. He was anti-Semitic in a huge way. Uh, so this, of course, is, is, the, is the Holocaust and, you know, the Holocaust, what's a Holocaust? Destruction or slaughter on a mass scale based on anti-Semitism, Christians only, Jews not allowed. Uh, this is, uh, this is his, his philosophy was very anti-Jewish. But let's, let's, let's be fair. Let's be honest. Uh, Franklin Roosevelt, the, the president of the United States fighting Hitler. Uh, Roosevelt refused to allow Jewish immigrants to come to America to escape persecution from the Nazis. The St. Louis was a ship, and it came to the uh, shoreline of America. It had a thousand Jewish refugees on board. They wanted to have access to American port to get asylum and, and, and be and be safe. And Roosevelt refused, and the ship had to go back to Europe. And many were later sent to extermination camps and killed. So it's a war for freedom, yet there was blood on many people's hands, okay, including the president. So, but but Roosevelt's gone, and Harry Truman becomes the 33rd president. He comes in at the end of the war, which he was the vice president during the entirety of the war. But but he is uh, doesn't have much much longer to to do. So he becomes the president, and the war pretty much ends. So VE Day, victory over Europe, is what VE means. May 8, 1945, Hitler's gone, Mussolini's gone, the Nazis collapse, and the spoils of war were about to be divvied up amongst the Allied powers, and we'll talk about that next chapter. So the war, the war in Europe is over, um, and many, of course, the people in Europe are jubilant, but America's got another war to fight. They've got to fight the war in the Pacific. You're fighting the war with Japan. So 
after Japan had attacked Pearl Harbor successfully, although didn't take the island, that was a, that's a key point you can look at. They, they didn't occupy it. They destroyed the fleet, but a lot of it was, was at sea, so they didn't lose all of it. But they did solidify their position in the, in the south, uh, Southwest Islands. Most of these islands, the Philippines included, all were, were occupied by Japan. This, this huge you know, kind of barrier for anybody to, to come and attack Japan itself. And you've got to get to an, close to an island and liberate that island and then create a base of operations to then attack this country. You can't, you can't do it from here and go over it like this. You've got to island hop, okay, and get your, get your base and your planes and your people and your men, your troops, your supplies closer. So this, this war in the Pacific was truly about island hopping. If you study the history of war of, of the war in the Pacific, it's all about that. Island after island, next, next island, next island. Uh, Battle of the Midway is the most famous one, a crucial turning point for the Allied troops uh, after getting beaten by Japan over and over. They finally have a, a huge victory at Midway, because Midway, it's halfway between Japan and America. Uh, the American Navy crushes the Japanese fleet uh, by air, airplanes launched from aircraft carriers, artillery by sea, a huge battle of significance in the Pacific. And they finally are getting close. So here's here's Japan right here. Midway was not quite close enough, but they're close. Uh, so America starts to see that this idea of invading Japan, just like they invaded Germany, a little, little different, but the same idea, is becoming more obvious. And so the thought of invading a country that was entrenched in a defensive position, heavily fortified, like D-Day, it's a daunting task. It's, it's different than D-Day because it's not going to happen in one place. It's going to happen in many places. This invasion of Japan uh, is going to happen uh, in you know, different places. Uh, so how, how, do you get, how do you get a people uh, fired up to fight a, a war like that? It, it, it's going to mean death for many, many young men, young American men. Uh, the thought was it would take years and that the number of American deaths would be in the hundreds of thousands, in, including the Japanese also. A, a huge amount of people were going to die. Uh, so you see these images here and the, these, these stereotypes that, that were, you know, that were created uh, kind of racially stereotype, racially um, uh, designed stereotypes that were against Japan. And they called them Japs and yellow monkeys and inferior and deadly people that need to be exterminated. So uh, in America, America had a long history of stirring up the emotions of the men, American men, by depicting the stealing of a white woman's virtue. So here you see two images here, especially the one on, on the right. Uh, this fires, you know, American men up and and. Of course, again, it's propaganda. They they, they want to get men fired to, to, to go and do this invasion. That's, they will probably cost your life, okay? The Japanese, uh, you know, are, are, are realize that they're, they're losing this war, and they become a little desperate, and they turn to what, what were called kamikaze pilots. Uh, a pilot would fly their planes into battleships on purpose, sacrificing their lives. Japan became known as a people that would fight to the death and would never give up. And here you see a squadron of kamikaze pilots. Uh, the families of these people were, were people of honor for generations. If you were a kamikaze pilot, there was no higher honor than, than giving your own life for your, your country's cause. Okay. Okay. Um, so invading Japan. It's a, it's not just D Day. It's it's five D Days. It's it's different places. You can't just be in one place. You got to hit them simultaneously to spread their army out. This is a big undertaking, and and it's it's uh, you know how how's it going to happen? What's going to happen? And plans start to be made about about doing this. Okay. But then a, along comes another solution. Instead of invading Japan, we'll do it a different way. So. Um, you know, as as mostly young people, what, what what is your first thought when you see this this image here? I mean, nuclear war. Uh, you know, many people actually say Hiroshima, Hiroshima, Nagasaki, and we'll talk about. And that's a good answer. Uh, but but in your lifetime, 
in like not too long ago. Um, perhaps some of you are pretty young, but you've heard about the search in the Middle East for weapons of mass destruction. George Bush Jr., George W. Bush pushed this idea tremendously and started a war over it. We've got to get these nuclear bombs out of the hands of the wrong people. Uh, the United States has a fear today that a belligerent country such as Iraq, Iran, Pakistan, Korea, North Korea has been threatening you know, to, to start something with America with nuclear bombs. They have tests. They, they're able to fire a nuclear bomb intercontinentally. So these are all present day, modern day worries. But it's interesting to, to see how America has this fear of a belligerent country getting a hold of a bomb that could be deadly for the whole world. I mean, the idea of a nuclear bomb in the wrong hands is interesting. Why is it interesting? Has there, has there ever been a nuclear bomb dropped in war before? Has there ever been a nuclear war? Yes, World War II ends as a nuclear war. Who is the country that drops the nuclear bombs? Two of them, the United States. Uh, again, why? Because you don't want to invade Japan. And, and Truman is, pushes this idea through. We're, we're going to drop these, these bombs and destroy these cities. It'll, it'll bring Japan to their knees. They'll have to uh, surrender and we won't have to invade. OK, so they drop the bomb without, without any warning. And that's uh, Hiroshima, Hiroshima, however you want to say it. Both are correct. The Enola Gay on the right, that's the name of the ship that, that dropped the first uh, nuclear bomb in world history, and that is Colonel Paul Tibbetts, the pilot that flew the plane, considered a hero in those days as, as the pilot of the man, the first nuclear bomb that was dropped. Uh, now, I'm not suggesting he's not a hero anymore, but I would say that we look at it a little bit differently. I don't, I don't think we look at, at dropping bombs in Japan as a as an honorable thing, uh, is it shameful? I mean, it's somewhere in between. It, it, it's, it used to be honorable. It's, 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 it's diminishing as time goes by. Because then the only, the only country that's ever dropped nuclear bombs is the United States of America. Uh, so, uh, so again, they, they, they dropped the bomb on Hiroshima. The official reason is to avoid a costly invasion. Uh, but what happens to Hiroshima? 70,000 instant deaths of mostly civilians, and as many as 150,000 die later from radiation sickness. So complete devastation of an entire modern city. <clears throat> uh, the American forces weren't entirely sure what was going to happen, how big this bomb would really be. It was much more than they thought. It, it just obliterated the entire city in, just, in, a, in a matter of just seconds. Never have been seen before any kind of destruction like this. Uh, we talked about technology running ahead of military tactics in the field, but this was a whole other level. Okay, so America waits to hear from Japan. We surrender, but Japan doesn't respond. So three days later, they drop another bomb on Nagasaki. So two bombs are dropped. Uh, 60,000 instant deaths, and then, of course, more than 100,000 radiation deaths later. Uh, Japan always said it would only surrender if they were in complete ruin, and after these two bombs, they thought, we are in complete ruin, and they surrender, and that leads to BJ Day, or Victory Over Japan Day, August 15, 1945. Uh, so, so World War II is officially over. Uh, this is the both both theaters are done, and the Allied forces are successful. Japan surrenders August fifteenth, nineteen forty-five. So what what is the cost for America? Four hundred thousand American troops killed, three hundred thousand wounded in four years, an incredible amount. Uh, three hundred forty thousand. I'm sorry, seven hundred thousand casualties, almost three quarters of a million either killed or wounded. Uh, this affects every community in America. You know, none, nobody escaped the carnage. You knew somebody that, was, that went over there and died, or you knew somebody that, that had lost a limb. It, 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 it affected every person in, in the country. Uh, so you, you remember World War I, remember the war to end all wars. Uh, it was only 27 years earlier. Uh, and remember how insane it sounded when I said that 18 million people died in that war? 
And that was why they called it the war to end all wars, the Great War. We'll never do this again. We don't need a League of Nations, Woodrow Wilson. We will never make this mistake again. This is horrifying. But they do. And in fact, it's much worse. So 27 years later, uh, the end of World War II, total deaths in World War II, 60 million people, soldiers and civilians. That's, that's in its entirety. So 60 million people over three times World War I. So add them together in a 30-year period. You have 78 million people on the planet die. That is an incredible amount of people that are gone. Most young men, you, you have the brain drain. You know, tomorrow's leaders, young, young men in those days, I'm, I'm excluding women because they did, um, they would go on and, and, and become leaders. But now they're gone. You have a huge amount of young people, young men that are gone. So how, how do we relate to 78 million people dying? Is, is there a way for us to relate to that? Well, l l let me see if I can if I can give you an analogy here. Uh, if, if you've ever been to Qualcomm Stadium when the Chargers were here before they went to Los Angeles, uh, if you've been to that stadium when it's full of people, it's pretty amazing how many people are really in there. 75, 78,000 people or so. When it's when it's sold out and I've been there many times and it, it's it's almost hard to believe that you're in the sea of people. So imagine that you're there at Qualcomm. It's full of people. The game's going on. And suddenly everybody died but you. So I'm not I'm not trying to be too morbid here. I'm just trying to, trying to give you an analogy, a way to wrap your brain around how many people 78 million is. So you're in Qualcomm. Everyone just drops dead except for you. So imagine the sea of bodies that you're in. If you're walking, you get out of your seat, you go down the stairs, you you walk along the aisle around the perimeter of the field, and you, all you see are bodies in the seats. Not not a seat's empty, just a a, a body. So imagine that. That's 75,000 people. So if you can imagine that experience, and, and I think we can get our heads around that sort of. You know, maybe it's a little weird. But imagine that experience 1,000 times. That many people dead 1,000 times. That is the number of people that died in World War II. You can kind of get a better feel for that. So, so, so lots of people. Okay, lots of people died. Uh, it was a, a horrific uh, situation. It was almost un, unbelievable that they did it again. And of course, Woodrow Wilson is wagging his finger from the grave. You people should listen to me. You know, I, I knew that it was coming. I knew there'd be problems. We you needed to come together and come to the table and work things out. You, you needed to, you know, uh, see these things coming. But you did it again. It's three times worse. And it's it's all on you. So so Woodrow gets his revenge from the grave. So so what's the result? of the war. I mean, it's the Europe's in complete ruins. And this is the same as the Civil War, but much bigger, much bigger. Every manufacturing center in Europe would look like this. Germany and Japan were in complete ruin, utterly destroyed. Britain, utterly destroyed. Britain would not be counted as a world power again after this war. Not to suggest that they're not a power, but not a top, top power. Uh, this war took a lot out of them. So, so much for the war to end all wars. Uh, the cost was huge uh, for people on the planet. But truthfully, the victory against fascism and a bleak world order was complete. The world, at least from American eyes, uh, was now open to the idea of democracy. And they start to push that agenda. This will lead, of course, to the fight against communism that we're heading towards here. Uh, America becomes the world power at the end of this war because they didn't have any cities like this. There, there wasn't any, any battles on, on United States soil. With the exception of Pearl Harbor that happened early in the war, well, as far as the Americans are concerned, uh, that was a, a United States territory then, but caught in the United States, the, the, the lower 48, nothing happened there. there. No, there wasn't a bomb dropped on any city. There were some German U-boats that were seen off the coast of New York and down the coast, but they never amounted to much. They didn't look like this. American manufacturing centers were humming along because they were manufacturing for the war. This will put them in a very unique situ uh, 
play situation moving forward to become the number one world power that we are today. So the depression's over. Uh, in America, the, everyone everyone chipped in for the war uh, cause. and uh, But truthfully, the war brought the country out of the Great Depression. And as we'll see in the next chapter, typically at the end of a war, the, uh, the economy will sag because you don't have to be producing as much as you used to. But we'll see that, that this this production keeps going and we'll figure it and we'll find out why here. OK, OK, that is the end of Chapter 24, Part 2. Thank you.